Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless it. Hi, thanks for tuning in to Armor of God. As always, I'd like to say thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us, and hopefully you'll be edified with what we've put together for you here. Anyway, in the past two videos, we've been talking a lot about Adam and Eve and the book of Genesis in general, and I've enjoyed listening to Father Carlos Martins whenever he talks about the book of Genesis and the authority of Adam in the beginning. Have you ever wondered, if only God had not created that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then Adam and Eve would not have eaten the fruit? And I think you'll find Father Martin's explanation here particularly interesting. So the book of Genesis informs us that the Lord made the earth and everything in it and gave it to Adam to guard and cultivate. He formed a covenant with Adam. And I'll read from that passage. The Lord God then took the man and settled him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and care for it. The entire physical universe was Adam's. Right? But there's a but here. Right. So although Adam owns the universe, is the prince and ruler of creation, there's a limit to his authority. Right. So uh, in Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 16, the Lord God gave the man this order. You are free to eat from any of the trees of the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. From that tree you shall not eat. When you eat of it, you shall die. And this limit was necessary because the limit is what preserves Adam's proper relationship with God. If God had not placed a limit on Adam, I mean, we, we can say, you know, gosh, if only God had not created that tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil. But, but if that tree wasn't there, if there was not a limit on Adam's choosing, Adam eventually would come to believe that he is God. God preserves his relationship with Adam by limiting Adam's relationship with everything else. And then there's something that Father Joseph Iannuzzi shared during one particular podcast I think you might like to know. And it's also about Adam again. See, many of us think when we read the recount of Genesis, of God creating the universe, that light preceded life. Because when in the Genesis recount we read the different acts creations God brought forth, light precedes man. God separated light from darkness. After he created the animals and the vegetables, etc., then Adam comes last. So many of us therefore think that light preceded Adam, but this is not true. See, in time it did, but not in God's mind. God conceived Adam before he conceived the universe. And it is only by virtue of man that the universe was created. In fact, Paul alludes to this in his letter when he says that all things were created in view of Christ who would become man. To sublimate human nature to a higher degree in dignity and nobility than that of the angels who surpass us in knowledge. But by virtue of the incarnation of Christ, all light entered the universe. And this very light that comes from God, who, is, who generates his son from eternity as light from light, true God from true God, does the universe receive its light. Even though Christ was not incarnate before the creation of the universe, the light that is in the universe came from him. Even before he was born. Because Christ doesn't have a beginning, obviously. And by virtue of God's pre-existing merits, that is, foreseen merits. Light existed in the universe. All things, St. Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians, were made in view of Adam, in view of Christ, in view of Adam, in view of the new Adam, the new Adam, the new Eve. So here we have that concept of Jesus being the firstborn of all creatures. Anyway, for the next part of this video, I'd like to share something from the late Father Gabriel Morth, as it has been quite a while. And it is something that is very important for us all to remember, the reality of hell. Anyway, in his own words, Father Amorth shared the following about hell. We have some stories about hell that, because they are taken from private revelations or experiences, do not bind the faithful, but nevertheless have a notable value. 
I have spoken on more occasions in my books and in my interviews of the experience of St. Faustina, who in her diary writes of her spiritual journey to hell. Stories and visions like these have to make us reflect. For this reason, pray and offer sacrifices. Too many souls go to hell because there is no one to pray and offer sacrifices for them. Being in the kingdom of hate, damned souls are subjected to the torment of the demons and to the sufferings they reciprocally inflict on one another. In the course of my exorcisms, I have understood that there is a hierarchy of demons, just as there is with angels. More than once I have found myself involved with demons who were possessing a person and who demonstrated a terror toward their leaders. One day, after having done many exorcisms on a poor woman, I asked the minor demon who was possessing her why he doesn't go away to which he replied, because if I go away from here, my leader will punish me. There exists in hell a subjugation dictated by terror and hatred. This is the abysmal contrast with paradise, the place where everyone loves one another and where, if a soul sees someone holier, that soul is immensely happy because of the benefit it receives from the happiness of another. Some say that hell is empty. The response to this affirmation is found in chapter 25 of Matthew's Gospel, where it speaks of the last judgment. The upright will go to eternal life, and the others, the cursed, will go to the eternal fire. We can certainly hope that hell is empty, because God does not wish the death of a sinner but that he convert and live. For this he offers his mercy and saving grace to each one. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Thus, he insists on our continuous conversion supported by the grace of the sacraments, in particular the sacrament of penance. Returning to the question of hell, whether it is empty or not, unfortunately, I fear that many souls go there, all those who persevere in their choice of distancing themselves from God to the end. Let us meditate often on this. Pascal said it well. Meditation on hell has filled paradise with saints. Well, I hope you've learned something from that bit from Father Amorth there. And for the next one, I thought it'd be interesting to share something from Father Yanuzi about the late Fulton Sheen. So Christ's suffering gives suffering all value, and Christ's suffering is timeless. So if someone in the nursing home is suffering, and then they're not offering their sufferings up, that is completely wasted. And that's a shame. Archbishop Fulton Sheen, great orator during the 70s, 60s, he would go whenever he flew for the propaganda fide to different countries to help establish international relations to promote the Christian faith. The first place he would go after he landed the plane was the nursing home. He made that his rule to tell all the people there to offer up their sufferings, don't waste them. He called nursing homes and prisons um, breeding grounds of the greatest conversions and salvation stories. Because that's where people can offer up to God treasure troves of grace to help save other souls and pur purify their own. And unless these people are properly catechized, they won't know how to use their sufferings for their own glory and for the glory of all other beings. Not just suffering, but the resurrection. Because suffering is a means, it's not an end. Remember, it's plan B, not plan A. As a result of original sin, suffering came about. God is using that temporaneously just for the next few years, from 2000, from the explosion of Eden to the return of Christ in the flesh. He's going to be using the suffering, but when he comes back, suffering will be gone again. And our glory will be eternal. So our focus shouldn't be only on suffering, it should also be on the resurrection. Anyway, for the last part of this video, I'd like to share what Father Vincent Lampert is saying here about the devil and God, which is very important for us to remember. They are not equal, not even close. It is common for evil spirits to gather in clusters and work together and to be under the coordination of a single master or manager spirit. Just as there is a hierarchy within the angelic world, there is a hierarchy in the demonic world. At the center of resistance to the demonic is courage courage that is rooted in our faith in Jesus Christ. As we read in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, perfect love cast out fear. Whenever we grow in our love for God, we crowd the devil out. Superstition about demonic forces and what they are capable of must be dispelled. We should never give the devil and his demons more credit and power than they deserve. God and the devil are not on the same playing field, and we should never treat them 
as equals. Well, that is all for the video this time. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video, and as always, I hope you've learned a lot. And remember, if there's any feedback or suggestion at all, please don't hesitate to let me know in the comments below. Anyway, for those of you who'd like to support our works, I left a link to our PayPal donation in the description box below, and from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for your continuous support, contribution, and prayer. Until the next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and God bless you.